Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to uh, discuss type 2 diabetes medications this morning. Um, after John's very um, comprehensive introduction, I think we've set the scene for diabetes medication and escalation in our population. I was one of the few people perhaps who, who responded that I um, wait in, in keen anticipation when I have a patient with um, diabetes present. I always take the opportunity to make um, some changes and, um, and really empathise with people in their juggle with, um, with this condition. So I'd like to talk about um, how different type 2 diabetes medications work and their hypoglycemia risk. Um, I know that um, Zarvin will be talking about insulin, um, what's new in um, pumps and sensors, I believe, so I'll stick to the, um, to the other medications. I'd really like to um, just introduce the superior cardiovascular outcomes with the SGLT2 class of um, medications and the GLP-1 receptor agonists, along with the superior renal outcomes with the SGLT2 inhibitors, as well as just give a broad overview of the funded and non-funded medications that we have, um, and focusing in on the role of ildegliptin as our recently funded medication for type 2 diabetes. And briefly at the end, um, I'd like to introduce a study um, around precision medicine approaches to type 2 diabetes in our population. So um, we all know about the strong evidence base to reduce harm from diabetes, and hence all our work on diagnosing diabetes and treating this, both early in terms of avoiding the, um, the legacy or the, or the latency effect of, um, of delayed glycemic control. And we also screen and treat associated cardiovascular risk factors for blood pressure and lipids and smoking cessation, et cetera, all to try and reduce these um, micro and macrovascular complications. However, when we look at our statistics, these are um, Kanti's Monaco statistics from uh, Wing Chen, who, um, who, showed, who looked at the proportion of people with HbA1c above 75 are predominantly in the red and in the blue, representing Māori and Pacific people. And if you see that the age across the x-axis, the most worrying aspect of this is that the younger people are having the worst control, and that has um, implications for all those complications that we wish to avoid. And when we look at the underpinning reasons, they're really complex. But on the left, I've tried to put down some clinician inertia factors, and on the right, some patient inertia factors. And they both result in an average delay in escalating our medications. We know that type 2 diabetes is a progressive condition. And over time, our, people will, our patients will need um, escalating support from one or two or more agents required. And, uh, and often that delay in terms of achieving glycemic control is detrimental and people suffer complications along the way. And off these, um, one of the key reasons for inertia is side effects on the patient side and also, um, also complexity of the treatments. And when we look at our diabetes treatments, they, one of the feared complications is hypoglycemia and also weight gain is an undesirable consequence. And not all medications are created equal in this regard and particularly the sulfonylurea medications and insulin have the most tendency to cause hypoglycemia and weight gain. Um, but we're always striving with, um, with trying to lower HbA1c and that's a kind of a price we, we have to pay and tread very carefully. So when we look at what type 2 diabetes actually um, is arrived at, is due to a consequence from a number of different underpinning pathophysiological processes that are uh, quite complex. And whilst we don't kind of measure each of these components when we see our patients in front of us, we know that the different medications target those abnormalities in a different way. So when we look at insulin and sulfonylureas, insulin actually um, uh, replaces the insulin deficiency and hence has a quite a large um, uh, effect size to be had. But it can also, when it's not there at the right time, can, or is, is there at the wrong time, it can cause hypoglycemia and weight gain is a compensatory response. And sulfonylurea is to a smaller extent um, is an insulin secretagogue and has those same, um, same resulting effects. All these other medications that are listed um, do not have the same effects on hypoglycemia. In fact, on their own or in combination, when they're not in, um, used in combination with sulfonylureas or insulin, do not cause any um, appreciable increase in hypoglycemia. 
Um, the insulin sensitizers are pyoglitazone and metformin. There's about three agent classes of agents that act on the gut system. And there's the SGLT2s, a relatively new class of agents that acts on the kidneys. Um, and so I'll take you through those in a moment. So if we just summarize the hypos and weight increases, they're predominantly with sulfonylurea and, um, and insulin. Um, all the other agents do not cause a hypoglycemia, but there is a weight increase on average with pyoglitazone um, with use around three kilos. I've asterisked two classes of medications that have more excitement around them as, uh, in, in terms of cardiovascular outcomes, and GLP-1 agonists and SGLT2s so I'll take you through um, slowly, but firstly just to highlight what GLP-1 agonists are, they are um, currently very expensive. They're um, unfunded medications. It's a peptide, a bit like insulin, so it has to be injected subcutaneously. And, you, and there, we do have exenatide, either as the, um, uh, as the slow release form that can be given once weekly, or the twice daily injections that can be given um, with the morning meal and the evening meal. And you can see the price um, estimate. It's quite a lot, and not very many patients will um, will entertain this, but a few may um, if um, they're really desiring weight loss and um, freedom from hypos and, um, and potentially the once weekly preparation. So it's worth knowing about that. DPP-4 inhibitors are now funded as of October last year, and they're an oral, tab uh, oral preparation, one tablet taken once or twice daily, and, um, and it's neutral on weight and has low um, impact on high, and low effects on hypoglycemia. So how do these two classes of agents work? Well, when we um, eat food, our gastrointestinal tract responds by releasing some gut hormones, predominantly GLP-1 and GIP, that act to amplify the pancreas's own insulin response. And most importantly, it's a glucose-dependent rise in insulin. So even when these um, hormones are amplified, either as um, analogs of, um, of as exenatide preparations, um, long-acting or um, twice daily, they will not cause hypos because they um, allow insulin to be released only in a glucose-dependent fashion. Now there is an enzyme that our body has called the DPP-4 enzyme that degrades these endogenous GLP-1 and GIP hormones, and by inhibiting those, that DPP-4 enzyme, that's the target of this vildagliptin class of medications that we now have funded, we're able to amplify endogenous GLP-1 secretion and thereby restore some insulin secretion and blood glucose control. So when we look at um, uh, superior cardiovascular outcomes, that the reputation is um, there for the GLP-1 agonists, it really came from the New England Journal paper in 2016 of liraglutide, which um, is in the same class of GLP-1s as our um, available exenatide in New Zealand, that this recruited about almost 10,000 people at high cardiovascular risk with type 2 diabetes, and they studied major adverse cardiovascular events that shortened to MACE, and found that there was a reduction, 13% in the liraglutide versus 15% in, um, in the placebo arm, and hence they got um, statistical significance and actual clinical, clinically meaningful improvements in major adverse cardiovascular events in patients who were already receiving be best practice blood pressure, statin, and all the other smoking cessation type um, interventions. And hence this has an FDA approved cardiovascular in indication. Unfortunately, la uh, two years ago when Exenatide ER by Durian, the once weekly formulation was tested in almost 15,000 people, but with and without CVD, so that's important in the studies, they didn't actually enrich their population with the higher CVD risk. They got an event rate that was un not statistically significantly different in the Exenatide group versus the placebo, and hence it doesn't carry the FDA approval for cardiovascular indications. So we just need to be mindful of that when we are um, discussing the role of Exenatide. We know that this class of agents, particularly liraglutide, which, which we would prefer to have um, registered and available and eventually funded, hopefully, in New Zealand, it, we, it, it doesn't carry the same cardiovascular indication. Um, other classes of agents in this group have also not got, um, they've got non-inferiority, but they don't have cardiovascular superiority that liraglutide has. 
But they, they come with their own side effects. So GLP-1 receptor agonists do have some injection site reactions. There are some gastrointestinal side effects and renal impairment and, um, and some very rare um, uh, um, risks of increasing pancreatitis and um, being contraindicated in those with a thyroid cell cancer. The side effects of DPP-4 inhibitors are um, uh, more commonly, dizziness, headache, constipation, but rarely hepatitis in the order of sort of 0.1%, 1 in 1,000, skin reactions and pancreatitis. So we do have to monitor liver enzymes with this medication class. Now, if we switch to the SGLT2 inhibitors, this oral medication that acts on the kidneys, it comes at a cost of $90 a month. It's not funded, but it is registered. And this class of agents comes from, uh, is particularly dapaglyf, that is the only um, a medication in this class we have registered in New Zealand is dapagliflozin, or Fosiga, one tablet once a day. And this comes from a family of SGLT2 inhibitors, all that have the ending of flozin, so dapagliflozin, canagliflozin, empagliflozin. The first um, one of this class, empagliflozin, was announced in 2005 when I was at the um, American Diabetes Association meeting, and as these results were announced, everyone stood up and clapped. I mean, I have not been to a meeting where people do that, and it was really... Um, impressive that the people who were um, in this study and had implicaflozin had a reduction in their MACE, a reduction in their hospitalisation for heart failure and a reduction in cardiovascular death. Now that is a really um, a hard um, uh, um, outcomes to actually um, obtain and hence it has the first FDA approval um, in, its, in this class for a cardiovascular indication um, in the US. We don't have empagliflozin, but we do have dapagliflozin registered and available but not funded at $90 a month. This one in the study um, earlier this year, um, unfortunately, did not have any um, superiority demonstrated. And partly that could have been because, again, the study chose to recruit people with or at-risk people for cardiovascular disease, so their event rate wasn't as high as empagliflozin. And one could say that had the study population been those high cardiovascular event group, then maybe it would have reached the same significance. So currently it doesn't carry the FDA approval for cardiovascular indications. Canagliflozin, again, another class that we don't, um, uh, another medication in the same class that we don't even have registered, does have a reduction in um, MACE and hospitalisation for heart failure. Actually, I must say that the um, significant benefits on heart failure are still there in dapagliflozin, although um, MACE is not there. Now I'm going to quickly run through the renal outcomes. I don't really have time to discuss those. This Credence study came out um, uh, earlier this month, actually, in New England Journal of Medicine about canagliflozin's effect on kidney outcomes. And you can see the renal-specific outcomes were 30% lower in those who got the blue um, canagliflozin versus placebo. And what we can say from all the meta-analyses to date with the SGLT2s is that you get a reduction in kidney outcomes. You get um, some reduction in hospitalisation for, um, for heart failure and you get MACE improvements depending on how you choose your population with impaired renal function or not. So overall the bottom line is that this class of agents do have moderate benefits on major cardiovascular events, including hospitalisation for heart failure and reducing progression of renal disease. So they work in the um, kidneys, so where the proximal tubule, it stops the um, reabsorption by the proximal tubule, and hence there's a lot more um, uh, excess uh, elimination of glucose in the kidneys. But it does carry a side effect of urinary tract infections and genital infections. Doesn't have the glucose lowering effects, which are relatively modest if your EGFR is below 60. So whilst it's not damaging for the kidneys and is actually quite good for the kidneys, it won't lower blood glucose um, below that. So our guidelines internationally are that we start with metformin and then we add on any of these classes of medications that I've just discussed, sulfonylurea, pyoglitazone really, a DPP-4 like vildagliptin. SGLT2, we only have DAPA. Glyphlozin and GLP-1, we only have exenatide and we have insulin. And we can use that in, as a combination therapy, eventually culminating in insulin for most cases. We've got a couple of cases to take you through with metformin and, and vildagliptin versus um, uh, vildagliptin um, added on to sulfonylurea. We just need to be mindful that this um, 
Vildagliptin is not for use in children, pregnancy, breastfeeding, hepatic impairment or severe heart failure. So I'll let you read through Mr GT's case example, who's um, a truck driver, he's obese, um, his HbA1c has gradually drifted up over the past two years. He does have some microalbuminuria, but normal renal function. He's got mild impairment in liver enzymes. And for him, switching to Galvumet, which is a preparation we do have funded in New Zealand, um, 50 milligrams of Vilda with one gram of metformin in a single tablet, means that if he takes one morning and night supplemented with 500 morning and night of metformin, he's essentially taking two classes of medications with less pill burden than he was before. So um, that he has had some modest improvement in his HbA1c from 64 to 58 three months later, and he had no significant change in his ALT. So that's, that's kind of one case example. But if I had more time to make this interactive, I would have asked you about how many of you would actually have referred him for bariatric surgery, how many of you would have had the conversation of SGLT2 inhibitors, because had he been able to fund that himself, that would have been superior on his um, renal um, outcomes. But I'm just going to race through the second case of Mrs. VG, an elderly woman with stage four in stage, near end stage kidney disease who doesn't want dialysis, definitely doesn't want insulin injections, and really has um, really um, recurrent UTIs and incontinence that she's wondering whether it is because of her um, uh, hyperglycemia. And here, just adding Vildagliptin one tablet a day was actually quite effective in this lady who I saw um, prior to when Vildagliptin was actually um, funded, um, improved her HbA1Cs and she um, had improvement in symptomat symptomatic improvement of ut UTIs, incontinence, dry mouth, um, and, and, and so forth. So um, this is one of the few medications that you can use in near end stage renal failure without adverse consequences. So in the last one minute, I'm just going to um, suggest that whilst we have um, averages for our patients in terms of what we expect from each of these classes of medications, if, if we added a pyoglitazone and sulfonylureas, it would be somewhere between um, these classes of agents, so around 1% or in the old units, or about 10 to 11 to 12 millimoles on average. But we know that there are studies on stratified responses to medications that show that ethnicity, um, BMI, um, C-peptide, lipids, can all affect the responses to various classes of medications, including particularly DPP-4 and pyoglitazone. And so it's taking these standard one-size-fits-all and, and putting some science behind the clinical reality that we see of people who are even who, of those who take the medications, there's varied responses in glucose lowering. So what we'd like to do is pluck out who would respond to these different classes of medications by, um, by testing this. And this is where um, I'd like to do, um, make you aware of a study that we're conducting here in New Zealand trying to see whether we can um, test whether people respond to pyoglitazone or vildagliptin differently and whether we can predict those who will respond by ethnicity, age, gender, genetics, particularly wanting to recruit Maori and Pacific because we want to make sure that um, we're not broadening inequalities and inequities and we want to make sure that the funding that we have of current <coughs> medications means that they will be allocated to people who get a response from them, and those who don't can be fast-tracked to other medications that will work for them, and that way we can still achieve um, good health outcomes um, without blowing our budget. So we really need your help with uh, referring patients. Um, we're, our target is 300 patients with type 2 diabetes. We're wanting anyone with an HbA1c above 58 who's not already taking insulin, Vilda, or pyoglitazone. They could be on, they need to be on metformin and or sulfonylureas, and we'll be um, treating them with uh, four months of vildagliptin and four months of pyoglitazone in random order. And we're keeping you informed with their results throughout. So um, at the end of the study, um, we'll ask you to make the final decision in combination with the patient's preference as to what their long-term therapy should be. So thank you very much for that, and um, I look forward to um, discussing more soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.